This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Episode 167, and we had a phenomenal guest. I know I say it all the time, but this week was Professor Hirsch Sheffrin, and we talked about the psychology of investing, and this was an incredible 90 minutes of information. And we just finished the interview and, and Ben and I started talking about how great it was. And we said, hold it, let's save the energy for the intro. So with that, I'm gonna let Ben carry on with his enthusiasm. So Hirsch wrote this book in 1999, uh, Beyond Greed and Fear, Understanding the Psychology of Investing, which was the, the first real full, full treatment of behavioral finance. Like he, he took the research that he was doing, uh, and all, all of any behavioral finance, behavioral economist person that you know the name of, um, he was either co-doing research with, or he yep. wrote about the research in his in his book. Uh, so he's he's right there at, at the um, at the start at the start, right? And, and that comes out in, in our interview too. Uh, but he's out there at the beginning of behavioral finance, uh, debating in, in papers back and forth with the people saying that markets are rational, and, and Hirsch is one of the guys coming back and saying, "Well, no, here's why they're not, and here's the here's the evidence to to prove it." Uh, yeah. So re- reading his book, it, it's like a, it's like a time capsule. I guess any book written in the past is like a time capsule, but it's, it's fascinating to read, uh, because the, the field of behavioral finance has developed so much since then. And so many of the ideas were relatively new when he wrote his book. So reading, reading it and seeing where things are today, it, it's, it's a fascinating experience. And then talking to Hirsch about it and about the history and about where the field has gone and, and how we can use the information. It was I, I really found it to be a very energizing conversation. It, it was, we talked to him for an hour and a half and it flew by in the snap of a finger. Well, we talk about it in the interview, how hard it was to come up with the right number of questions. It was really hard. You just read the book and the questions just pour out of you. And you look at the people he's worked with over these years, like Dick Thaler, Mayor Statman, Kahneman, Tversky. It really is. He, he's a super impressive and very yeah. nice guy. And yeah. he's Canadian. Yeah. Born in Winnipeg. Yeah. He's now a, a professor in the Department of Finance at Santa Clara University, author of four books. And I want to give a shout out to our friend uh, Alex in San Jose, who is a good friend of hers and made the introduction for us to to welcome him onto the podcast. Yeah, it was an unbelievable opportunity to be able to speak with him. And, and for, for an hour and a half, too, it was, uh, yeah definitely a, a, an excellent conversation so we, we hope that you enjoy it Professor Hirsch Sheffrin it's a great pleasure I must say as our fellow Canadian to welcome you to the Rational Reminder podcast my pleasure to be here thanks so much for inviting me Cameron uh, and, and we must confess that your body of work is so large that it was quite challenging coming up with a manageable number of questions. Like just reading your books, the questions just kind of pour out of us. We'll do our best to keep them on time for you. So let's kick it off with a question about your 2002 book, Beyond Greed and Fear. So the book starts with a key message from behavioral finance. Can you start by describing what that key message is? Key message of the book is that psychological phenomena permeate the entire landscape of finance. And then when we focus specifically on market psychology, there's a a phrase we often use that, you know, fear and greed is what market psychology is all about. Um, And this book is intended to say that we, we, our understanding really now goes well beyond greed greed and fear as primary determinants. And it's important for for investors in particular to, to understand exactly what we now know as market psychology from from a a conceptual perspective. So your book came out in 2002, I believe. Has anything changed about your message since 2002? (laughs) No, we just know more details. Uh, But the underlying messages are pretty much the same as they were were at the time. That was a a 2002 edition. The book actually came out at the end of 1999. Of course. Uh, yeah, but uh, we, it, it wound up uh, getting um, uh, republished a couple, a few times. So, 
one of the things that you did in the book that was really quite amazing for such a large body of work that existed then, and it's even even bigger now, you organized it into three themes, which which makes it a lot easier for someone like me learning about the subject to, to think about. Can you tell us what the themes are and how behavioral finance treats them differently than standard or traditional finance does? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so uh, the, the first theme uh, is called heuristic driven bias. And uh, it, it takes the phrase that's used in, in the uh, behavioral literature, heuristics and biases, and says, look, people are imperfectly rational. We, we weren't designed to be perfectly rational. We've come a long way and we do wonderful things, but we do have imperfections in the way that we make judgments about the world and we make decisions. So we have to rely on workarounds and those workarounds are called heuristics, a, a Greek word in meaning discovery. So we discover ways to, to deal with our imperfections and our limitations. And in, in the course of, of uh, using these workarounds that do a decent job, but because they're not a perfect job, they're in some ways biased and, and bias, biases are understood to be um, predictable deviations from something that's that's right. So you're off in a, it's not that just there's some mistakes or errors, but that the errors have specific directions to them. So that's the that's the first thing. Understand that that investors in particular, uh, dealing with risk and uncertainty, uh, confront a very complex world and make sense of it by by relying on heuristics that by their nature predispose them to be subject to biases. Um, and, and then the second, second um, uh, theme uh, we call framing effects. And, and framing effects are, are, are really complicated um, when you sort them out, but the general idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. And that's the words that we use to describe a problem or an issue or a challenge are important. We can't assume that people will be able to um, be immune from influence about the way that they either describe issues for themselves or have those issues described to them. Any salesperson knows that the words that they use when dealing with for the customer are important. And, and that's because customers interpret language and form pictures in their minds. And so the word framing is a technical word for really description. Uh, and we are sensitive uh, to uh, the way that uh, words are, are used when, when we hear them and interpret them. So the, the thing about uh, framing effects is that we react not just unemotionally, although we do when we try and understand what the words mean, but we, we, all, we always react emotionally as well. And so the words that get used or the pictures that get used, the way issues are described for us, generate some kind of emotional resonance with, within us. And we respond differently and our experience is different. And that's especially true in an investing context because investing is very emotional activity. Uh, and so that's the second thing. And, and then the third thing uh, is uh, uh, inefficient markets. Um, it, it, it used to be the case that um, investors understood that that some stocks are underpriced, some stocks are overpriced, and that really smart investors can uh, make a little extra money by discovering which is which and making investment decisions to capitalize on, on the fact that markets got things wrong. And that was uh, true until the mid 60s and early 70s when academics said, oh no, wait a minute, actually, uh, markets do a pretty good job at, at pricing securities. And you know, if we look to see whether we can find evidence of mispricing, uh, we, we can't. And so the perspective of the 1970s was that markets got things right. So this is a little bit of a, a, an overreaction, I think, in, in academia. Uh, markets weren't wild and crazy all the time, uh, uh, which is what people thought before the mid-1960s. And then they weren't perfectly rational and efficient, which is what, what academics started to preach in the 1970s. Um, so th 
so the, the point of, of, uh, of this third theme is to recognize that markets don't always get it right. And, and that the impacts of heuristic-driven bias and framing effects on market activity lead prices in, in some instances to kind of be out of, out of kilter, we'd say inefficient. So those are the, the real, the, the, the overall, the, the key three themes that describe what, what behavioral finance is. Right. Now, how does that differ? Oh, so sorry. How does that differ from the, the traditional perspective? So the working assumption in, in uh, neoclassical uh, finance, which uh, dominated the field for uh, at least 25 to 30 years, uh, was that uh, by and large, Investors don't make mistakes, or if they do make mistakes because of heuristics, the biases are small. That's that's the first thing. So um, it's it, it, Merton Miller, um, who was a very famous neoclassical economist, um, basically you know said of of uh, work of behavioral economists that it's not that there are interesting stories, there are interesting behavioral stories, but they're a distraction, they're, they're a sideshow. And his colleague, uh, Franco Mendigliani, you know, said the same thing about, about that work. And both, both uh, I, I mean, I have to say so, you know, Franco, Franco and, um, and Merton, I, I, I really, I, I adored them both. They were on the complete office end of the academic spectrum for me. And when they made those statements, they were making statements about, about the work that I was doing. Uh, but wow. that was that was the, that was that was the perspective that they held. That it was a, it was it was not there was inconsequential, but it was a sideshow and of minor significance. Uh, so uh, heuristic driven bias, yes, maybe, but the biases are small. Framing effects. Now, so here's where we really had a difference of opinion because the Medigliani Merton perspective named for them was that framing effects are non-existent. That's that's really what Medigliani and Miller had as their life's works message to the rest of us, that investors will be able to perceive, see through any framing to identify the underlying fundamentals and get the fundamentals right. They won't be misled by framing, by so so that was that's the second thing, and then the third thing is that neoclassical economists you know believe by and large that that markets are 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 uh, efficient, and you have you know a, a strong version and a not so strong version. The strong version is that uh, prices are the market provides us with prices that are absolutely right, uh, correspond to um, intrinsic value. And then the, the somewhat weaker version says, you know, markets aren't 100% efficient all of the time. But when they get a little inefficient, there's enough smart money always on the lookout to make a buck that those small inefficiencies will get identified and then exploited by arbitrage activity. And so inefficiencies might pop up but they won't be large and they won't last long. They'll get arbitraged away. And the behavioral perspective is just the opposite. The behavioral perspective is that inefficiencies will pop up on average. You should be surprised if they don't. And moreover, they can get bigger, much bigger, before they disappear over time. Hmm. So they can be large, and persistent. Those, that's the perspective. Um, so, so if you wanted to contrast the behavioral perspective and the and the neoclassical perspective from those in terms of those three things, that's that's how I tend to think about the, the three the three issues. Great, great explanation all, all the way through. That was that was amazing. I, I love hearing the little. Uh, you you explain the history of how these theories developed, like hearing you talk about Miller and Medigliani and how they were responding to your work when they were writing their papers. It's like, for for me as a uh, as a relatively recent, I mean maybe nine years ago now, finance student. Uh, yeah, it's just just cool to hear to hear you talking about that stuff. Uh, si- since then, so again, we're talking about this 2002 edition of your of your book where you categorized everything into these three or organized everything into these three themes. 
have any other themes developed since then as the research has grown? Um, I, I would say I, I still maintain, I, I think those three things still provide the broad categories, um, but we've refined our understanding of, of, of many of them. So um, I'll just, I'll just give you uh, a couple of, of directions that, you know, have really um, come along that provide us with, with, with extra insight. Uh, when, um, so, so I'll start with, with um, my, my own beginnings in, in the behavioral area. So, uh, so Richard Thaler, who I think is the, the world's most important behavioral economist, he and I were each other's first behavioral collaborators in the 1970s. And the work that we did uh, at the time was to develop a, a framework that uh, uh, underlies what, what Dan Kahneman in his magnificent book calls Thinking Fast and Slow, two systems, you know, one that's instinctive uh, and in, intuitive and the other that's, that's co this corresponds to conscious thought. So, the, the, um, so Kahneman and Tversky, we're not actually working in, in a, with a two-system framework uh, when they develop the heuristics and biases approach. Um, so Dick Thaler and I actually, I think, presented the very first formal two-system two, two framework. We called it a two-self model. And it was intended to um, explain what, why people have self-control difficulties and how they manage self-control difficulties. So, the, so that particular framework... Um, is neurological in nature. It says we, we really need to stop thinking about human brains as being monolithic and, and homogeneous and single entities, but they're, they're really systems that where the components interact with each other. And the reason that people have self-control difficulties is that sometimes one system uh, is stronger than the other. And if the two are in conflict, then you'll sort of gravitate between what you want you, what you think you should do and what your emotional system says you want, want to do. Um, so, so that was a, 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 some people say that that's really the very first a neuroeconomic model uh, that, that was, uh, that was uh, structured. So Dick and I presented that work to Kahneman and Frisky in 1978. Um, and that was well before uh, the, the field we now call neuroeconomics came, came into being. It was before uh, economists and neuroscientists got together and started to look at what happens um, from a brain activity perspective when people make economic and financial decisions. But since that time, neuroeconomics has exploded. And so now, we understand things that we only had an inkling about in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, we, we understand the role of dopamine flows. We, we understand what, what, what's going on in the brain when we talk about um, reward systems. These are neuro reward systems. We know which brain components are activated, the nucleus accumbens. We understand the role that dopamine plays in generating excitement and pleasure. Um, we, we, there's a literature that developed in thrill-seeking and in, in, in investing activities, and we understand exactly neurologically what, what's happening in that respect. So, mm. so there's a lot of insights that have come from the joint work of, of, of economists and neuroscientists, neuroeconomists, uh, that's, that's really uh, shed great light on on um, an insight into into the issues associated with with human behavior, so that's that's one that's one thing that's different. Um, and so when I talked about the emotional timeline, excuse me, <clears throat> in in, uh, in beyond greed and fear, uh, I had a sense of the fact that investment, when you, for example, saving for retirement, investing for retirement. It's not just you invest now and you wait 30 years and see what happens. You experience a whole series of emotions along the way as, as events take place. 
And those guide how you react along the way and whether you make decisions or um, are, are passive. And that's a very important um, you know, element that's there. It's not just about making a mean variance a choice at time zero and then waiting until time capital T to see what, 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 the, outcome, what the outcome is. Um, the other th- uh, thing that's happened it, I think is that we now, we now understand that um, so when when Beyond Meat and Fear came out, um, uh, we understood that, and I, I started the book by mentioning this, it's not greed and fear that you want to think of as sort of the key issues driving market psychology. They are present, but fear definitely. But the, the, the other key emotion that counterbalances fear isn't greed, it's hope. Mm-hmm. And, and, and greed is a sin. You know, it's one of the <laughs> deadly sins. But, but investors are hopeful about, about what they can do when they invest, what the outcomes are. And that's not a bad thing. You know, greed's kind of a bad thing. But, but, but hope isn't. Now, you know, hope can be strong. Now, there, however, there is um, a, a third emotion that you do want to couple with those other two uh, that was made clear to us by a psychologist named Lola Lopez. And I, I, her work is just very deep and, and very insightful. And she said, uh, people are goal setters. People set aspirations. And in addition to, to wanting security to alleviate the emotional um, uh, component we now we call fear and in order for uh, uh, to uh, deal with potential we want upside potential to, to to help us meet our need for hope so but she said there's also people have goals and those goals involve setting aspirations and some people said, aspirations that are quite high, and they attach great importance to achieving those aspirations. So for them, not achieving an aspiration amounts to failure. Success is defined relative to the goals that you set and meeting those goals. And so people we think of as having very strong drives, uh, being highly competitive, they set high goals and they attach great importance to achieving those goals. And what you find is that if you have really high goals and it's super important, those are the people that take the biggest risks because the only way to have a good shot at achieving a very high goal is to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And it's that perspective, as opposed to the standard deviation, return standard deviation notion, that is underlies what risk means for for regular people, especially for investors. Um, So uh, the the notion that people have wants is is that key addition um, that was part of the uh, first uh, introductory remarks in in Beyond Greed and Fear. And we now know a lot more about that. And what we've really seen happen, especially because of the millennial generation now, is that millennials have a much clearer sense of what they want from their investments, and it's not just returns. Um, So in the mid-90s, social responsible investing uh, came in. Um, My my, um, uh, co-author and colleague, Mayor Statman, has really been um, a critical uh, academic in terms of emphasizing the importance of that. And and, and what that work tells us is that investors care about other things besides return. They they care where the returns come from. And so their own values wind up being expressed in in their investment activity. And that sits within the emotional response to framing. You know, what, how, how uh, issues are described. And so the description can, can entail what it is, the source of the money or, or the, uh, the way that the money is, is expressing itself on the economic um, uh, uh, landscape. 
So I so I'd say that you know those are two ways in which the field has changed, but the themes are the same. It's really that we're having a, a much richer development of of what those themes mean. Fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to go back to the theme of market efficiency, and you talk about how markets can become or go out of kilter. So I'm wondering, based on that, should investors still own index funds, which makes so much sense in the framework of market efficiency? Yes. So, um, at, so at the end of Beyond Green Fear, I, I talk about you know the lessons, the takeaways, um, and the, the lessons for most investors, not all investors, but for most investors, is from a financial wealth generation perspective, act as if mark, invest as if markets are efficient, even though they're not. If you're, a, if you're in it for the long term, you want to be careful not to outsmart yourself because there are two counterbalancing forces at work because of behavioral issues. The first is markets are not fully efficient. And so there are theoretical profit opportunities. And the second is you can be the victim of your own behavioral biases. And if the biases are stronger than the potential for alpha, you will be sorry in the long run. Most people will be sorry. And that's why most investors earn less from a return perspective than the overall markets, because their biases get in the way. So uh, it's not as if it's not as if there, there isn't theoretical alpha alpha out there waiting to be uh, exploited. Alpha exists as a potential, but you 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 have you have to be pretty close to neoclassical in your behavior to actually exploit it over the long run. And you have to be willing to take a risk. So there's a, there's a message at the end of the book is to understand the following. Number one, most investors should invest as if the efficient market school prescription is right. Don't try and beat the market. Just put together a long-term sensible investing strategy and stick with it along the roller coaster. Second, what behavioral forces will do, especially heuristics, heuristic-driven bias, is it will inject volatility into the market over and above fundamental volatility, the volatility created by fundamentals. So because of that, you have um, sentiment-based risk, risk associated with changes in sentiment. Uh, sentiment being psychological uh, forces at work, the things that uh, impact us because of uh, uh, um, heuristic driven bias in particular, but also framing effects, uh, um, which I can talk about uh, 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 later. But but because of that, um, it's 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 a, it's a wild it's a wild ride. And the best thing is for most investors, from a financial wealth perspective, is simply act as if. It, 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 be willing to experience sentiment-based risk. There's really not much you can do about it. It's simply the cost you bear for, for getting a decent return in the long run. Um, and uh, if you can accept it, then you can sort of have peace of mind uh, over the long term in terms of your investment. Now, having said that, um, I'm going to come back to the you know the, some of the other things we've we've learned. We've learned a lot uh, since since the publication of the book. I knew when, I, when Beyond Beat and Fear was published that that people had psychological needs from their portfolios as well as financial needs, but I don't think I understood the extent to which they had psychological needs relative to financial needs, and. Um, so the literature that developed on thrill-seeking behavior was really insightful. Um, the literature that developed on, on lottery stocks, the fact that there are certain classes of stocks that have similar features to lottery tickets, 
Um, and, and the extent to which individual investors load up on those stocks, I think that was really insightful. Um, I, I know when Beyond Greed and Fear was published, I didn't know, for example, that in the US, and I, this is also true in, in Quebec and Canada, um, that the expenditures per household on lottery tickets is really quite significant. So Massachusetts, which typically is number one in terms of uh, lottery expenditure per household, the average household, I have to take, be careful how I say this. If you take the total num uh, number of dollars spent buying lottery tickets in Massachusetts per year, and you divide by the number of households per year, you will get a number over $2,000. Come on. Yes. <laughs> yes. And what you'll find is it's a little bit lower in Quebec, but it's still not insignificant. This tells us just how strong people have a need to take on very high risk investments, hoping against hope for a wow. huge payoff. So, so these are these are and 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 the thing is, lottery stocks are you know they, they comprise all, just under ten percent of individual investors you know portfolios. So what that means is that there's a very strong need to really have a huge increment in your lifestyle by taking those kinds of bets. And lottery stocks are similar to lottery tickets in that they're negative net present value projects. So when you, when you spend the money, the odds are against you that you're gonna, hmm. <laughs> it's money that you need to be able to afford to lose because most people are gonna lose. Uh, when they make those kinds of investments. It's just that a few of them will wind up benefiting handsomely because things will, will, will pay off. So th those are some of the you know, issues that, that um, are helping us to understand what the landscape looks like. The three themes are still intact in terms of the pillars that help organize our thoughts, at least mine. Um, but but the, but the you know the other elements are are really sort of filling in a lot of the details, and those those really were uh, not known to me anyway. You know, twenty years ago when when Beyond Greed and Fear came out. So you, you talked about most most investors should probably invest as if the market were efficient, which is something that we've said said before. Uh, even if it's not perfectly efficient, we should act as if as if it is. Uh, in in Bessem Bender's papers that came out on the skewness in in individual stock returns, he finished one of the papers by saying something along the lines of th there are alpha opportunities just based on the skewness in returns, but anybody that thinks they can capture them should review the literature on overconfidence. Some something to, to that tune. H how do you think someone should decide if they are one of those people that has the skill to pursue alpha? Set aside a small portion of your portfolio you can afford to lose. And so, you, you know, I think that I think it's important for people to understand um, the system to the rational part really needs to sort of um, don't have a few drinks when you think about this. You really want to be clear headed, understand what's really important to you and understand the difference between your long-term financial goals and the other things you want your portfolio to do for you. Um, we're, we're competitive by nature, more competitive people set higher um, aspiration levels. Um, investing is in part a social act because um, where we sit in the, in the social hierarchy is important to most of us we're, because we're social animals. And, and so a lot of the time, the reason that we, we buy a lot of stocks is because we want to advance, you know, socially, even, you know, even, even, even billionaires compete against each other, not because they're worried about where the next meal is going to come from, but because their goal is to <laughs> be higher than, than some other billionaire. Um, so, so these are very strong, very strong uh, uh, social impulses that we, uh, you know, that we have. So I would say, you know, many, many people simply want to know and you, 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 you won't be able to know, unless, there's no test you can take. Uh, that's a, a, pen, a pencil and paper test. You have to actually try it out. So you invest uh, in, in, in the real sense. 
you take, you put some money down and you see, you know, whether you can, uh, how well you can do in terms of exploiting alpha. It's just that when you do it, you need to be careful. It's because if you're, if investing is addictive for you, then you may need an AA program for investors so that you don't get caught up doing something really detrimental to your long run uh, welfare. But if if not, you know, just the same way that, you know, people can, most people who aren't uh, subject to uh, alcoholic based illness, can um, can have a drink or two and be just fine. You can you can try try it and see. Um, so the you know portfolios are satisfying other needs besides financial needs, even though they're tied up with with finances. And it's important to understand the array of services um, that I call it the service flow from portfolios. I think I used that term in the on reading period. I can't remember, but I certainly used that term back in the 90s. You want to understand the service flow from your portfolio and understand that it's not just about wealth creation in the traditional sense. It, it's also about having a whole wide array of other needs that get met. Wow. That's obvious when you say it, but also I haven't heard it described like that before. And it's uh, kind of mind blowing to, to frame it all that way. So does that explain why so many institutions continue to hire active money managers? Is there something different that goes on with institutions? Well, um, I think that uh, there are different ways of thinking about it. And, and, and institu- institutions are different. But I'd say I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the cynical view for the moment. Okay? And then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll move away, I'm away from that. But I just want to do it to... As, as, as a way to get the conversation going. So the cynical view is that institutional uh, institutions understand all of this, um, but are profit maximizing institutions. And they're no different from any other sector of the economy. So you make a buck by satisfying uh, customers' needs. And it's possible that you can also um, help to cultivate those needs uh, in the same way that that tobacco companies encourage you know, young people to smoke so that they get hooked and then you can continue to sell them tobacco products for the rest of their lives. So if you can if you can um, get investors hooked on the idea that um, it's possible to beat the market consistently, that smart investors can do it, that the institutions know how to find the smart investors, and that you can join the club. And even if you're not smart enough to find the alpha yourself, you're certainly smart enough to find the institutions that hire the active managers, yep. you know, then, then you'll find you have a, a nice business model that, that feeds investors' needs to generate positive alpha and therefore feel better than average. So we know from the overconfidence literature that people do not like to feel like they're below average. Everybody wants to be above average. Average is sort of the, the least <laughs> thing you're willing to put up with is being at average. Um, so you simply cater, institutions cater to, to, to those particular to those particular needs. So that's that's the you know the absolute cynical view. It is simply a right. uh, a, no, a, no, a knowing uh, a profit maximizing strategy. So, but you know, I, um, you know, we're you know working working in the in, in the field, you know, with active money managers. I think that you know that's not um, uh, true of of all institutions. I think that there are many people who spend their lives on the active on the active side, uh, and I think they, they you know they, have, they they come at it with conviction that that investing is a game of intelligence, just like just like sports. And that uh, those who are better at it will be able to generate a positive alpha, and they're willing to try. And 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 to an extent, you know, behavioral finance says markets are not efficient, so there is there is something out there to compete about. Uh, and in theory, it is possible to generate alpha, you know, uh, that's positive over over the long run and. Consistently, it's just a, a question of, of what, what what the odds are of doing it. Uh, 
So I, I think that there there is there are uh, you know many active money managers you know who are uh, smart people and and have conviction that what they're what they're doing is um, actually finding alpha. Um, so the less uh, cynical, but still somewhat cynical perspective is that those active money managers do in fact find positive alpha on average, but they don't share the rewards with their investors. Right. They charge fees that soak soak it up. And so you do get to say as an investor who invests with a successful active money manager, see how smart I am. This is who I use. And this is these are the returns my active money managers created. And you and you can. You, you, you can signal to the rest of the world how smart you are. It's just that it won't show up in the value of your portfolio because your fees will be so high. Um, so that's the second thing. But at least it's a service because for many, because, because this need for social competitiveness is very strong. So I'm not saying it's not without value. It is, it has value in two investors. Uh, wow. uh, yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, that's that's fast. That that's the the, the Burke and Green idea, I think, right? That that the value accrues to the to the manager that can produce alpha, not to the investors. But you're saying that they're the investors may actually be getting a I don't know what you'd call it an externality, a social benefit from investing yeah. with that manager. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And and so uh, and then active money management is you know a little bit like and so I think that you know Hank Besson Binder's you know point about positive skewness is is true. And the positive skewness is what is is what lottery payoffs are are about. So yeah. it also you know comes together as a in terms of a conceptual framework. This this conversation is just fascinating. Um, <laughs> I, I want to shift gears a little bit to asset asset pricing. Uh, one, one of the core principles of investing in, a, in an efficient market is, is supposed to be that risk and expected returns are, are related. Investors need to expect higher returns to invest in riskier assets. But you've looked at this and other people have looked at it empirically. Do investors actually expect higher returns from riskier stocks? No, <laughs> just the opposite. So they expect, they expect that uh, uh, safer stocks will... Uh, uh, actually have higher returns. <laughs> so, uh, what, what, what does that tell us about risk-based asset pricing models? Um, now, so that's, so that's a different question um, huh. uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the asset pricing models themselves. So the, um, so one of the most interesting you know, findings from Fama and French's work when they started to look to see what to, to find a, an integrated perspective to help us understand how the, the traditional CAPM perspective on, on uh, market premiums, uh, equity premiums, and um, uh, size and value growth book to market, how those things come together. One of the things they found in their early work was that the, the coefficients on beta, on traditional CAPM beta, but in that integrated framework, were negative. So meaning that, in fact, uh, the, the higher your beta, the lower expected return, everything else being the same. And that was a bit of a shock to them. Now, it wasn't strong. It was, but the fact that it wasn't positive, <laughs> as well as strong, that, that, was pretty, that was pretty surprising. Um, so let's just understand Warren Buffett, you know, one of the... Um, uh, uh, most famous in, investors in, in the world um, ha has a philosophy that's enabled him to be, you know, very successful over the years. And one of the key elements of, of his uh, investing philosophy is that the stocks he picks are not super exciting. They're low beta. But you see, those are the stocks that have the higher excess returns from the negative relationship, and then he uses leverage. So the, you know that you, you you know this is the same thing that you know it's uh, you know so Bernard Watson also follows this philosophy that you have an insurance company it generates huge cash flow from premiums, and then it basically you can leverage up your portfolio as a result. So. Um, when you you know follow this particular uh, investing philosophy, you you can 
generate positive alpha over the over the long term, at least sizable, consistent uh, 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 return performance. So, from a from an asset pricing perspective, it, it 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 can it can go the other way simply because in most of the investment community has this upside down perspective on on risk and return. So I'll give you a little bit of history about um, about what what I discovered in my in my own work on on this topic. Uh, I knew a little bit about it when I published Beyond Weed and Fear, and I came to to, to uh, understand it a bit more uh, deeply as as time went on. In the in the late '90s, there was a a paper. Um, uh, by an Israeli economist named Yoav Gansach that suggested that that risk and return appeared to be judged to be have a negative relationship as opposed to a positive relationship, and uh, I uh, then started to test that um, uh, first with my own students and then with hedge fund managers, and I discovered that when you ask the question broadly, um, what do you expect? What's the relationship between risk and return if, you, if you're thinking in terms of correlation? Are they positively correlated, no correlation, negatively correlated? Almost everyone would say, well, of course, positively correlated because you know, if you had any experience with textbook finance, that's what they would have learned. Now, if you then ask them to do specific tasks to evaluate risk and return on individual securities, security by security, and you get them focused on those local tasks, and then you take their analyses, and you then do the broad perspective, that's when you'll see that their judgments cross-sectionally suggest that they believe risk and return are negative related. So whether you use beta as your measure of risk or some um, non-specific general risk variable, call it what you want, just call it risk on a scale of zero to 10, whatever it is, what you saw was that consistently happened for most investors and not everyone. So over about 15 years, every single year, I would do this with a different group of professional investors, not individual investors. In the beginning, I did state individual investors. And what I found was it's even true of professional investors. So unless professional investors have some kind of consistency check in their frameworks to see whether they actually are assessing, making judgments about risk and return so that they're positive or related, the way theory suggests, their natural human psychology will induce them to, have, to drive it the other way. And so you will see, in, in, you know, in asset pricing models, uh, that you know that those those features will, will will come to be reflected. And you want to be, and you, and and also you want to be careful because you know the the behavioral message is, don't think it's easy to you know to to generate positive alpha by trying to exploit these mistakes. You can see about about the investors who shorted Tesla, you know, for years. You know, they wound yeah. up. Uh, you know, getting hurt. Um, so, so for investors who may want higher expected returns, does it matter? You know, for the value premium, for example, if the explanation is behavior based versus risk based. No, not 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 if not if you are not if you uh, simply take the perspective that I just know that. Over the long term, there's a actually a decent equity premium. Yeah. I don't know whether it's whether what extent it's behaviorally driven or fundamentally driven, and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Yeah. But the historical track record tells me that it's a it's a good bet, but it's still a bet. It could go the other way, but it's a good bet to in, in, invest as if the market's efficient, and then just let it let it run and wait. And wait for the returns and ride the roller coaster and don't, you know, have the discipline not to get discouraged in the middle when uh, when things look absolutely terrible. Um, then the, the the odds are are you know in our favor that that the returns in the long run will be will will be de- will be decent. And that's for the equity premium as well as the value premium. 
Uh, by the equity premium, you mean the fact that stocks uh, uh, earn higher returns than bonds or yeah. government bonds? Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. The so if you the behavioral perspective on the equity premium, you know, what is it? Why do we have such a huge equity premium when theory says it ought to be a lot smaller? Is that um, markets climb a wall of worry, as technicians say, that there is underlying pessimism about stocks that we get so fearful of all the terrible things that you know happen in the world by reading the news that. We think that okay, next year might be fine, but you know the long-term pers- um, uh, prospect for stocks is you know really really terrible. And if that's dry, driving every you know enough investors you know perspective that there's just gloomy, then then you wind up with a with a with a higher with a higher premium. And so it's it's pessimism uh, that is the is the main driver. Even though you know, we hear a lot about excessive optimism as being the, the dominant, as being the dominant hmm. um, uh, bias. What about momentum? I mean, with value and and the equity risk premium, there's probably a pretty good behavioral story and probably a pretty good risk based story. With momentum, the the story seems to tilt more heavily towards behavior based. Does does that in any way affect how people should use momentum in their portfolios? So momentum is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I'll, uh, uh, his, historically, um, m- momentum came up in the in the academic literature as a surprise. It came up as a surprise because the very first behavioral asset pricing paper was the overreaction paper by Devon and Thaler. And what, what they argued was that um, you get long run. You get reversals. Okay, that w- that 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 if you invest in winners, you'll wind up losing money on average because winners get overpriced. And uh, if and but if you buy, if you're willing to buy losers, uh, losers will revert back, and so you'll earn uh, uh, better returns for that perspective. So if anything, short past winners and 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 uh, go long in past losers. And then along came this story that said, well, you know, a lot depends on how you define winners and losers. If you define winners and losers by past 36-month performance, you'll get the debat thaler effect. But if you go based on past six-month performance, it'll go the other way. <laughs> well, oh, my God. All of a sudden, we had an inconsistent behavioral story that was turned upside down. And we, did, we didn't have an explanation for it initially. So the argument meant, well, maybe there's sort of short-term underreaction. And the reason that you have momentum is because in, investors get hooked on stories to explain what's happening. And when news comes along that's inconsistent with the story, they adjust, but, but not enough. It's an anchoring and adjustment uh, kind of an explanation. And so as they, it just takes them time to learn. And what you see is that you get drift, either positive or negative, as investors slowly adapt not quickly adapt, as in the efficient market version, slowly adapt to the news. Now, so maybe that you know that's part of the story, but I think the most interesting story is the story that ties back to framing effects. And so here's, here's the way that story goes. If, um, if you have a stock that um, has... Uh, had been doing well. And so a lot of investors have paper gains. And then what happens is that um, news comes along uh, that is positive. Then what you'll have happen is that um, the market will not fully react to the good news for the stock that has lots of paper gains because of the disposition effect. A lot of, especially individual investors, will start to sell their paper gains to realize them because they want to feel good and they're worried that the paper gains will disappear. So that will retard the adjustment Hmm. to reflect the full information. 
And so what you have is you have a framing effect giving rise to momentum. It's not so much that investors are underreacting from a heuristic driven bias perspective. It's the fact that their psychological needs are being met because they want to feel a sense of pride by selling their winners. And the reverse is true if um, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, on, the, on the loser side. Um, uh, so you, want, you wind up with, with a downward drift story for losers as well. So you have, so this is a testable theory because if you take two stocks that are subject to the same kind of good news events and one of them doesn't have a lot of paper gains associated with them and the other does, what you should expect to see is different drift levels. Momentum is what you'll see when the paper gains and not much momentum when you jump. And that, in fact, is, is, is what we do see. And so I know there are professional in- investors who put a momentum in exactly this way, that they, 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 they're just not willy-nilly about which momentum stocks they pick. They pick the ones by evaluating where the paper gains are, and that's where they put, put their money. And so it does make sense to trade on momentum. It's just that you really have to know what you're doing in order to uh, uh, to get the job done, and it's not as if that information is is available the the delivered to you in 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 a nice package by Robinhood or any, any you know any other trading platform. You really have to do the work in order to do it, and that's where professional investors excel. So, speaking of trading, Hirsch, can you uh, draw a comparison between? This recent phenomenon of you know commission-free meme stock, game stock trading, game stop trading that's been going on. So can you compare the current time, current era to the still like in the '90s when commission or online trading started back in the '90s? Can you compare these two periods? Yeah, they're different. Um, they're different in the sense that in the '90s there really were ideas that were nascent um, and you could tell decent stories about huge success. The internet, the the information revolution of the 90s felt like the new industrial revolution and it was sold that way. And so it was gold rush mentality in terms of looking for those companies Hmm. that that looked like they were gonna be tomorrow's big winners, the gorillas of the industry. Uh, Mary Meeker, who was the lead tech analyst for Morgan Stanley at the time, um, you know, coined, coined this phrase, the Walmarting of the web, by which he meant that just as Walmart went from being a, a little set of stores in Arkansas, food stores in Arkansas, to becoming the dominant retail firm in the world, uh, that was going to happen with e-commerce. Yeah. And and it was a matter of looking to see if you could, you know, detect what are the, the small indicators that tell you, you know, which of these small e-commerce firms is going to wind up being the dominant gorilla in, in the future. And so uh, even though there was this gold rush mentality uh, involved, it was fundamentally based in terms of structure. But with GameStop, um, and, and similar meme stocks, there were other psychological needs uh, that are being uh, expressed there. And that really has to do with the, the small guy versus the big guy. So it's, we're gonna show you who really has power since you know we feel that in the social hierarchy, you don't have much respect for us. And it's time that we're gonna teach you a collective lesson. And that was a very, very interesting episode that the whole point was not about generating long-term wealth or even about, although to some extent it was part of the story, was you know, generating very large in day trade returns, right. um, but about teaching, teaching somebody a lesson from a social hierarchy perspective. Although you did that by generating a high uh, first day return for yourself. You talked briefly earlier about thrill seeking and 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 dopamine and, and addictiveness. Is is stock trading addictive? Yes, for many. Now we know this. <laughs> Here's what we know. 
We know that the neural pathways associated with rewards, particularly the neural component called the nucleus accumbens, which, uh, ex which when it's activated, makes us feel really good. Uh, it makes us feel really good because of uh, dopamine flows. It's a major dopamine, it's on a major dopamine pathway. Um, so now we're at a point where we can put investors into functional mag magnetic resonance imaging machines and see what's happening in their brain when they're trading. And this, this is what we've learned. Um, we've learned that when you invest in a security that's experiencing a bubble, your reward system during the bubble will soar and you will feel fabulous. And that same expression of dopamine and those same kinds of feelings are what happens early on to you know, people who wind up with um, opioid addictions, that you wind up you know, really craving the, the dopamine flow uh, in, you know, in, inside your brain, whether it's you know, created synthetically or, or naturally. Now, they're not exactly the same because with opioid addiction, what does happen is that uh, synthetic opioids do um, um, wind up creating deterioration in your brain's own ability to produce dopamine eventually. The, the dopamine factory uh, winds, winds up um, being impaired. But nevertheless, it's true. Once you get you know, hooked on, on the dopamine flows, there's a downer when it doesn't happen. And so I think that investors really enjoy um, stock market bubbles. Um, it just feels really great. And so, you know, GameStop investors, you know, watching what happens, I mean, the, the sense of euphoria is real. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, that, you know, that, that's very important. Now, I think that that's, that has led um, the industry to cater to that by using techniques to induce stock market bubbles. Um, and, and the way that it's done is, I mean, it's done in a sophisticated way and it's done, uh, you know, not in overtly, much more covertly, but if you, if you look at, at security analyst reports, most security analyst reports stay away from doing fundamental analysis, but by which I mean DCF-based analysis. They'll use fundamental terms, but they will not use discounted cash flow based valuations. And those that do, um, don't do what textbooks teach. They use inflated DCF. And inflated DCF might apply to a very small minority of firms, but they use it in a way that applies across the board for the most part. And in the course of doing that, they lead investors to believe that market evaluations when they're frothy are supported by fundamental value when that is not the case. I, I, I was, I was going to leave this next question out um, in the interest of time, but you touched on it just now. So I, I, I think it, it's worth going there just with the additional context that you just gave her. I, th I think you were talking about, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here. I, I think you were talking about the growth opportunities bias that you've written about. I think it's worth if you can talk about briefly what what that is and uh, how it may be related to bubbles and to maybe the valuations that we're seeing with some types of companies right now. Okay, so the idea is um, here's what we teach in the classroom. We teach that when you value a company intrinsically by the cash flow it generates or you expect it to generate, you divide time into two distinct periods. There's the um, immediate future for the next few years when most companies have a shot, that may not happen, but have a shot at generating returns that are above average in the sense that the companies have some kind of competitive advantage that allows them to outperform what would happen for most of the market. But eventually, unless you're protected by patent or by 
the military. It's, it's very difficult for companies to have a competitive advantage forever because smart people come along and there are always disruptive technologies on the horizon. And so in the long run, we think that companies, if they survive, will earn about their cost of capital, but nothing more. And that just means they're returning a fair return to their investors, but nothing ab above and beyond that. So most kids cannot be above average. Most academics cannot be above average. Most investors cannot be above average. <laughs> most companies cannot earn more than their cost of capital. The cost of capital is like the average performance for, the, for um, providing compensation for risk. So growth opportunities bias is basically making the assumption that most companies are able to earn more than their cost of capital in the long term, not just over the next few years. And if you make that assumption, you will generate higher value projections down the road than is warranted by a calm, cool, rational, if you like, perspective. Um, and that's and that, in fact, is is what you find in most analysts' reports. Those that do DCF-based free cash flow evaluation, that they they implicitly, not explicitly, implicitly assume that companies will earn more than their cost of capital on average forever, not just in the next few years. And because most of the value of a company when you do a DCF-based computation, and we're talking 60% for the average company, 80 to 90% for a high-tech company. Most of the value is what happens in the terminal horizon, in the long term, not the next two or three or four or five years. It's, it's, a, it's a big number. It's a big contribution. And so if you get investors hooked on the idea that the market valuations that we're seeing when there's froth, are supported by sharp penciled analysts carefully doing their homework, you know, behind the scenes to reassure you, the investor, that stocks are fairly priced. Then you'll be wind up being misled. So that's that's one thing. And then right. I'm gonna just I'm just gonna add one more thing. Okay, because so this is a sleeper. Most investors and analysts don't go back in time and ask themselves this question. Did the companies we are evaluating, analyzing, actually generate the cash flows we said they would generate 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago? We generate the cash flows we need to support and justify the valuations that were in place back then because we're making the same assumptions now about growth opportunities buying. And what you'll find is there are enough companies, not all, but enough companies out there where the actual cash flows fell far, far short of the cash flows that were promised or expected, shall we say, back when the valuations were done. So my favorite one is, is eBay. I, 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 I like to show a slide because it's in, my, in one of my, in my book, Behavioral Corporate Finance. I, I did a case study in 2000, and I wrote it up in 2003, and the book came out in 2005. And I just said, okay, well, let's just look over time to see what happened to analyst projections. And so now what I do is I take the initial pre projections of free cash flows from 2003, and I say, okay, how did they look in 2010? What were, what were those same teams of analysts from those companies? What were they saying about free cash flows for the company over the next long term, starting in 2010 and 2003, well, all of a sudden the curve drops. Go out another five years and ask 2015, what did they say it was going to look like? Drop some more. Another five years, like 2020, down some more. Wow. So the projections just keep on going down for the, for what you're thinking will happen in 2030 and 2040 and 2050, and those are the numbers that we need to come up with how much. How to fair value, uh, not how to come up with a fair value for for for, for stocks. Yeah, that's just un unreal to unreal to think about. Um, we, we we have four more questions. Are, are we okay for time, Hirsch? To yeah, we're okay. Fine. 
because this is I'm telling you this is we we we, we talked to a lot of a lot of people uh, and this is this has just been unbelievable for for me. Um, okay, we'll uh, we'll carry on here. Um, it, it, is the mean variance framework relevant to individual investors? And this is an important question, I think, because in, in our podcast listener community, it's a bunch of people. I mean, it's, we're called the Rational Reminder Podcast, a, bu- a bunch of people trying to be rational investors. And in many cases, thinking about building a better portfolio from a mean, mean variance perspective. Now, Cameron and I don't say that you should do that, um, but it's what a lot of people who try and think rationally do. So is, is, is that framework relevant to individual investors? The answer is yes with a qualification. So if you want to build long-term financial wealth, because financial wealth is a primary goal, then mean variance analysis makes a huge amount of sense. Even when markets are not fully efficient. You just have to remember that many investors have other needs that their portfolio satisfy. And so mean variance is not the only set of tools that you have to have in place to meet investors' needs. It's not an engineering problem. It's partly an engineering problem, but there's this whole other set of psychological needs that go alongside the strict financial needs. And so that that would be the the short answer that I could give. So you prefer to having a financial advisor as enabling the investor to, quote, carry a psychological call option. Can you describe what that means and why that might be helpful to investors? Yes. So we have to remember investors um, among their other needs, are are the need to feel smart and the need to advance in the social hierarchy, at least not move down. And so if you have a successful investment, uh, you'd like to have bragging rights about it. So you can show other people how smart you are, okay? Either overtly or, or, you know, Canadians I think are, are more polite about it than Americans. (laughs) Americans. <laughs> um, but everybody, you know, has, has this need to, you know, just to uh, a signal something about an intelligence and, and status. So uh, it's nice to be able to take credit. And so having the call option means that you basically get to sell the stock. You know, if you have a call option, you sell the stock at strike price. And so you your strike price is set in a you know it's um, uh, way above your purchase price, so you can you know bank the gain when you when you sell, and that and that's what it means to have an advisor get get good advice, and then when the advice pays off, brag about it. And there's a put option too, and the put option is that on the other side, <laughs> it's a um, uh, when things go bad, uh, you you know investors really hate to feel stupid. People feel. You know, people hate to feel stupid. So investors are people. So investors hate to feel stupid. It's nice to blame somebody else. And if if you can find an advisor who's patient um, and it can can help soothe investor egos when things go wrong and not take it personally. So it's not easy to do when someone blames you. It's not your fault. You, you know, you've worked really hard. You haven't behaved unethically. You've done your best. I mean, it's just... You know, the markets are bad or the strategy didn't pay off. You know, value investing, you know, looked like a great thing. Ten years ago, you know, all the all the statistics said from from, from a historical perspective, value beats growth. Well, you know, you, you're a strong value investor over the last 10 years, you underperformed. And so um, there's, you know, there's a tendency for some investors who will want to blame their advisors for the fact that the you know, strategy didn't, didn't play out. And, and so advisors can say, well, you know, I did my absolute best. I went with what the averages, the historical averages said. Uh, it's, was it my fault? But just remember that part of your advisor fees are dealing with the underlying psychological issues. So you have to um, absorb 
the psychological loss of being blamed. And if you can do it gracefully and soothe your client's egos, they'll stick with you. It won't be because of psychological performance. One of the most interesting papers in the last couple of years is about the role of robo-advising. Vanguard did this incredible study and they found out what it is that investors are looking for in connection with robo-advising. And the thing about robo-advising is that many investors won't do it. They'll, even if it's cheaper, they'll still go with a person. Why? Because the number one need is peace of mind. And they don't feel they can get that with a robo-advisor. Hmm. Even if the advice is sound, even if it's based on the greatest mean variance algorithm, the human touch is still incredibly important, even for millennials. It's less important for millennials, but it's still important for millennials. And given all that you know about this field, do you agree with that sentiment? Do you think it's important that people do work with advisors, or many people do? Yes, I think I think I think it's I think I think it's important. Now it's a question. So I'll tell you honestly. I think I think that it's just like with anything else. It's a question of whether. Uh, investors get value for money. Um, so it's, it, so, it, and they can, because we understand that um, financial planning is a lot harder than it looks. There are certain parts of it that are easy, um, a lot easier than, than it's made out to be. But being disciplined, during the roller coaster ride is incredibly challenging. And it all comes back to my to the, the self-control issues I studied back in the 1970s. Self-control is hard. And sometimes you need a partner to help you get through it so that you don't make a mistake. You can wipe out half your portfolio wealth by selling at the wrong time during a downturn and then not getting back in because you, you're frozen. Like, like deer in the headlights. And a, and a financial advisor can help you make that mistake. When that happens, you will have tremendous value for money as a client if you've engaged an advisor. And simply, even if, even if the actual investment strategy is simple and you could, it looks like you could do it yourself, it's not just what you do at the time you make the decision, the paperwork. There are other biases, status quo bias. So people, yeah. you know, they, they, instead of actually doing it, <laughs> you, they can't get themselves to do the paperwork, you know, or the online version. Uh, so there's no question that, that, that there's uh, a, a, a potential value from, in, from engaging a uh, uh, financial advisor to, uh, to help steer. And then it's just a question of whether the, the, the advice and the service flow provides value for money to the clients. All right, I've got one of our last questions here that's probably a question that we could have spent the whole the whole hour and, and uh, a, a few extra minutes talking about, but well, maybe not. Maybe it's a quick answer. Uh, are, are dividends and capital gains interchangeable? No. <laughs> well, it depends. So the answer is, depends who you ask. So for some, the answer is yes. Um, but for, for many, many investors, uh, it's not, especially individual investors. I'll just say, for institutional investors, um, there are prudent man laws. And so uh, dividends can uh, help to support a legal argument in favor of prudent man behavior mm. for an institutional investor. Yeah. So even for institutional investors, it's the case that, that dividends and and capital gains are not interchangeable. But for individual investors, there are at least two issues. One is um, psychologically, a dollar that comes on comes in as a dividend, especially if it if that piece of the return looks stable and reliable, it gives a feeling of safety. It alleviates the emotion of fear, partly. So it generates a psychological benefit. A capital gain doesn't do that because it doesn't have that component that triggers that psychological reaction. It's a definite framing effect. Now, the second is that um, for people who um, uh, retire, they have developed habits about 
how to engage in prudent spending of their of their wealth. And during their working years, they got used to relying on their paychecks to support living expenses. And then everything else sort of got put away for the future or for large purchases. Um, well, once labor income, wage and salary income dries up, they no longer have that wealth cash flow coming in in a way that looks like income. And so their old habits won't work as well. And so they're looking for something that will work with their old habits and dividend income. We call it dividend income. <laughs> and the same with uh, the same with coupons, we call them income. So they look just you know, similar to wage and salary income. And so the same spending rules can, can be applied to them and it doesn't work for capital gains. With capital gains, you have to worry that once you start to access your liquid assets, you might be like killing the goose that lays the golden egg. You'll, you'll overspend and then mm -hmm. you, you'll outlive your assets because you didn't have a disciplined structure um, uh, in, in place to sort of deal with, with the withdrawals. And that also comes back to uh, the question of financial advisors. You know, financial advisors can help you with uh, with discipline once once you're into the, the withdrawal phase of your investment strategy. I heard um, Mayor Statman speak at a CFA wealth management conference uh, five, five years ago, I think, and, and he talked about everything that you just said, but then he also talked about the problems that come with a dividend focus, like you get a lack of diversification and you're probably better off with a more diversified portfolio that doesn't focus on dividends and using something like Monte Carlo to figure out spending. How do you think an investor should think about that that trade-off where the the you know Miller Medigliani optimal portfolio doesn't focus on dividends, the psychological one might, how does an investor take those two pieces and decide how to allocate? So you wind up in, in a situation where um, you definitely need comfort and you have to understand what the individual's habits are mm -hmm. and how easy it is for a person to change habits. So if you change the description of the income, the the framing of the way the money comes in. Um, if, if the description, although on paper, it looks like it's superior, doesn't match with the underlying habits, if it's a mismatch, you, you could do yourself great, great injury uh, mm -hmm. because you either overspend or you starve yourself right. instead of finding the balance. So the answer is gonna depend, I think, on the, on, uh, it'll vary from individual to individual. As to as to as to whether you can do it, do it or not, it's not it's not you know a simple one 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 answer fits all. Makes sense, Hirsch. You, your your work has been very impactful uh, to the field of behavioral finance and finance more more generally. Your your late uncle was also an important economist who did a lot of great things for the world. Can you tell us a little bit about him, uh, his work, and and his influences on you? You are so kind to ask me. Thank you. So my late uncle, uh, Frank Sheffrin, he was my father's um, oldest brother. And uh, he became an economist, an agricultural economist, and uh, went to work for the uh, federal government in Canada. Um, he worked his whole life, his whole professional life, thinking about how to alleviate world poverty especially from a food perspective. Mm -hmm. So he asked himself, is there enough food in the world to prevent hunger? Um, and his work, along with work of others, suggested that there really was a lot of food produced and that people were a lot hungrier than they needed to be in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. So he... he um, Working with the Canadian government, also with the United Nations, he was at the meeting, the UN meeting in Quebec City in 1946 that established the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO. Um, he was, uh, he became um, an emissary uh, of the Canadian government to every single FAO meeting from during his whole entire professional career. He was president in, um, so the most successful UN agency, I think of all time, is the World Food Program. 
which has branches in, in, in across the world. There's a Canadian WFP, an American WFP. Um, the WFP received the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Hmm. And uh, my uncle, unfortunately, you know, died in 1989, but he would have been so proud to see that. He, he uh, at the end of his uh, career, when he retired, said the WFP was um, the most successful UN program uh, uh, period. I'm happy to say that, that he was one of the co-founders of the WFP. He was, oh. the, he was the Canadian you know, civil servant who, who, who took up the charge and, 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 and worked with uh, a, a few other countries, the US and the Netherlands in particular, to, uh, to put the WFP together. Uh, he handled governance for the WFP. He was a, a key player during uh, its first um, 15 years, 16 years. Uh, and was uh, the, the Canadian representative to the to the body for that during during that particular time. He did a lot of good in the world, and um, he was a great influence on me. I think I became an economist really because of him. He took an interest in me from the time I was small. He would continually send me materials to read. Uh, he went publications. He went courier, uh, and um, I was. I actually thought I was going to be um, a physicist. That was my goal in life, not to be an economist. But he kind of sowed that seed in me, and I did actually <laughs> did study physics in, in uh, university. Um, but I found myself falling in love with economics at his suggestion. I took an economics course and you know, wound up converting over, and that is a terrible choice. Which, which way should I go? And uh, going the economics route. And he encouraged me, even, even in grad, in, when I was in graduate school in London, he, I my aunt, um, my aunt Flora, they, they, they visited my wife, Arna, and me in, uh, in London as we were studying. Wow. It's just a great influence on me, but you know, most importantly, more importantly, it was just a great influence on the world. Did a lot of good. Yeah. Wow. Thanks so much for asking me to speak about him. What a great, great story. So our final question, Hirsch, especially after a story like that, how do you define success in your life? Um, I think... It's, it's making the world a better place. Okay? Um, globally, if possible, locally, if possible, people around me, my students, my family, um, just you know, do, doing my, my best to create a little bit more happiness and if possible, happiness through knowledge. And if knowledge, behavioral knowledge. <laughs> I'd say though, you know, that for, for me, for me, that's that's what what's, what success is about. Well, you certainly shared a lot of knowledge with us. This has been an amazing almost hour and a half. So thank you so much for your time. This has been great. My pleasure, Cameron. Thanks so much for inviting me.